Good morning, everybody. On behalf of Optech Berlin Brandenburg and Photonic Israel, I warmly welcome all the participants. My name is Shlomo Glazer. I'm the manager of Photonic Israel. Photonic Israel operates within the Israel Engineer Association as a cluster of Israeli photonics entities. <clears throat> Our mission is to enrich the knowledge in this area and to encourage cooperation both within Israel and with photonics entities in the world. We are open to your suggestions and would be happy to promote new and local and international collaborations. This conference is the second in a series of online conferences that deal with different aspects of photonics. Our dear colleagues, the German Photonics Association Optech Berlin Brandenburg is the co-host of this conference. In these days, we are planning the Photonics Days Israel Conference. It's expected to take place in Israel in June 2021, and it will include an autom automotive session. Details and a link, and link to the registration will be published in uh, the upcoming Photonic Israel newsletter. I would like to thank all the speakers and the audience for their participation in this conference. A great thanks and appreciation are to the staff of Optech BB and Photonic Israel, Ms. Anastasia Jensen and Ms. Nufar Sharan Reicher for the organization of this valuable event. I wish you all success in your photonics research technologies and applications at the automotive ecosystem. I, I hope that this event will serve as a starting point for further collaborations. Finally, I wish the participants an interesting and pleasant conference and the creation of business collaboration that will enhance the contribution of photonics to the business of you all. So let's start and um, um, Let's start with Mr. Eli Elizach Dembinski is the Deputy General Manager of Ayalon Highways. Mr. Dembinski will provide an overview of the challenges in the Israeli automotive ecosystem. Mr. Dembinski, please. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted and proud to be your guest and open the Automotive and Photonics Conference on behalf of the Israeli Ministry of Transportation and the Ayalon Highways Company. Ayalon Highways is the Israeli government performance arm in promoting <coughs> smart transport, the largest and the leading governmental hub for transport technology. It promotes demand management, autonomous vehicle, six and embeds innovate technologies that aim to reduce the traffic congestion. My name is Elitzach Dembinski. I am the Deputy General Manager and the Head of ITS Technology and Innovation Division. I have a master degree in science and over 20 years of experience in managing companies in both private and public sector in the fields of infrastructure, energy, and technology. I also have experience in innovation, planning, and executing mega scale projects. Before speaking about photonics, I want to begin with a short story. Maybe some of you, both those who live in Israel and others from abroad, will be familiar with the name of Dr. Tzvi Tadmo, a pioneer among the researchers of solar energy in Israel, who won international recognition for his research and his applications, and also has doctorate in renewable energy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Tavor's story begins in 1955, when he developed a black coating to absorb sun rays and to prevent the emission, instead of using mirror as was customary until then. Thus, he was effectively responsible for the first breakthrough in Israel in the field of solar technology, the development of the selective surface, which is known worldwide as Tavor's selective surface. The selective surface significantly improved the solar energy absorption capacity and Tavor used to establish a trial machine for producing steam. Until the beginning of 1960, no industrial use was found for Tavor invention. However, at the start of the decade, 
Tavor surface began to integrate into solar collectors and turn the solar collector into a product that we are so familiar with today. This scientific breakthrough turned Tavor and his state of Israel into world leaders in solar energy technology and enabled the broad distribution of solar collectors use. Tavor is the developer of the modern solar water heater, which saves considerable quantities of electricity and energy, both in Israel and globally. In June 56, he received the Weizmann Prize for research in the exact science for the development by the Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. So what is the connection? Apart from using a photovoltaic cell to the conference we are attending today, most of you familiar with the solar collector, but most people do not know that in the 1970s, Svitavor developed an electric vehicle, which later will be called a hybrid electric vehicle. Thanks to the original idea of adding a small drive wheel, which improved acceleration, he succeeded in bringing the performance of the slow electric vehicle to the level of motorized vehicles. The model that he produced with his team was presented successfully at the Dieseldorf International Conference in 76. But as with other of his development, this is too also ahead of the time. And here, we are attending an international conference about one of the fastest growing and most important fields that will be here in the coming years, photonics. As you know, photonics is a central component in the fields, such as medicine, meteorology, advanced vehicle, defense security, and others. The countries are super international organization like the European Union see the photonics organization as strategic. According to McKenzie's study, in the year 2020, the global autotech market was estimated at approximately $238 billion, and we are expecting to grow to approximately $362 billion in 2025, and even to reach $469 billion in 2030. Regarding the industry in Israel, as of 2090, the investment in the vehicle technology since 2010 amounted to approximately $6 billion. Here, I am speaking from our experience at the Ministry of Transport and the Elon Highways. The optical component is highly significant in the field of smart transport in its assistance in passenger counting, congestion surcharges, autonomous vehicles, communication, and etc. We believe that with the right context and technology, these technologies will help to reduce traffic congestion as weak as pollution emission it will assist to monitor and compare e-volumes of supply and demand for public transport. As of 2020, in Israel, there are 400 companies, startups, and 25,000 people. 5,000 of them are engineers, which are engaged in the photonics field. Also, widespread research is being conducted in Israel Academic Institution on this subject, and the economic contribution made by photonic activity in Israel has been estimated at approximately $6 billion as of 2018. Let us look at a couple of examples from the among the companies that are engaging in the photonics field in the vehicle industry in Israel. Mobileye, one of the leading companies in the world in the development of the computerized vision, machine learning, information analysis, location and mapping for the advanced assistance systems for drivers and autonomous driving. Trii, a startup com company which was established in 2017, which has developed a sensor sensitive to waves to our, that are frequently that is not visible to humans, which are called SWIR, short wave infrared, that enable the reading of large volumes of data concerning the camera's environment. Our Robotics, an Israeli company that was founded in 2015, and which has developed a high resolution radar system, which provide a 4D mapping of the environment for the level four to five autonomous vehicles. Apart from the location of an object in the open, the radar also enabled the calculation of the speed of an object, which is done in reliance on the time that the wave takes to return and its form. Also, the radar reached a range of up to 300 meters, three times the range that types the LiDAR sensors the current market leader. Inovis, 
an Israeli company that has developed a high definition solid state type lighter sensor without mechanical parts, which is supposed to provide a fully accurate picture of the vehicle and virus. There are many more companies that due to lack of time, we won't mention, but today it is clearer than ever that photonics is a critical technology for the identification earthlings, for monitoring the trip, managing traffic, identifying people, and so on. To enable companies to succeed, the Israeli government has to encourage industry, not solely through incentives and grants, not exclusively through long-term research works, but also by facilitating access to high-quality infrastructure for experimenting, which enable technological testing at the most served standard. The Ministry of Transport and the Alon Highways will soon be opening the National Experimentation Center in, for the Smart Transport in Ashdod. The center has 84 square meters of infrastructure which enable experiments to be conducted on all subjects relating to autonomous vehicles and among other things in the photonics field. Many of the companies in this field use this facility which is subsidized by the government as part of the support provided in order to help the industry to thrive. Every company that succeeds is the country's success and the success for the global market as well. I encourage you to think of fields that we are not yet familiar with and dare to explore it. If Dr. Tadmor invented a solar collector and dreamed about electrical cars, there is an excellent chance that in this conference, there are enough bright minds who are already thinking about things that the rest of us have not even imagined. On behalf of the Israeli Ministry of Transport, and Ayalon Highways, I wish you all a remarkably successful <clears throat> conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dembiski, uh, for your uh, briefing. And um, the next one uh, is the, uh, from, the, uh, you, from the Innovation Authority. Dr. Hagit Schwimmer is the director of the Innovation Authority Israel Europe Directorate. Dr. Schwimmer department is in charge of mobility as well as health, food, agriculture, climate, environment, and energy. Dr. Schwimmer will provide a review of the funding opportunities for collaborations on innovation in transport and smart mobility in the new European framework program. Dr. Schwimmer, please. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you. My name is Chagit Vimer. I'm from ISERD, um, the Israel Europe RI Research and Innovation Directorate in the Innovation Authority. And I'm here to tell you about Horizon Europe, the European Framework Program, the very new um, program after um, Horizon 2020. Um, is not uh, with us anymore. Um, so a little bit about us. We're ISER, the Israeli Europe um, RNI Directorate. We're an interface between the Israeli government and the Israeli entities and the European Commission. Our job is to encourage Israeli entities like you to participate in the program and to take advantage of all the benefits it has. Uh, we're representing Israel in the program committees of the European Commission. Uh, we serve at the, as a national contact point. It's an official nomination um, for the different themes. Um, for example, I'm the director of the department, but in my department, we, has, and we have NCP for health, NCP for agriculture and food, and so on for energy, environment, climate, and mobility. Um, our job is to disseminate all the information, to give you all the data we know, all the information to participate in the program and to do it um, successfully. We are assisting um, throughout project submission and 
management. So in general, um, we aim at maximizing the benefits of the Israel participation in the framework program. So the current framework program is Horizon Europe, which haven't started yet. Um, it's going to be launched at the end of March or the beginning of April. So everything I'm going to say here today still can be changed. I don't think it will change, um, but I must say that. In addition, I must say that Israel used to be an associated country to the European Framework Program. We're not in Europe. Um, we haven't signed the agreement for the next program yet, but we're optimistic. Everybody are optimistic. And we, we're quite sure that everything will continue as it used to be. But I must say that at the moment, we haven't done this. Um, so Horizon Europe is the current European framework program, the main funding instrument for research and development. Um, it started in 1984 and Israel joined the program in 1996. It covers all major scientific and technological disciplines and it targets the major European industrial sectors. It has a lot of benefits and um, it's very recommended to take part of it. You can look at the budget um, from the beginning. It increases with the um, different programs. Um, Israel joined here at FP4, Framework Program 4 at 1996. And this is the current program with 95.5 billion euros for seven years. Um, you can see the, the uh, major goals of the program, strengthen the Europe, Europe scientific and technological basis and the European research area to boost Europe's innovation capacity, competitiveness and jobs and deliver on citizens' priorities and sustain our socioeconomic model and values. A little bit about um, Israel participation in the program. You can see the number Israelis um, take part in the program and do it very nicely. Um, but in general, you can see the number of the participants, um, the successful, the different sectors, all the sectors participate in the program. It opens for everybody. And our success rate, which is different in the different programs. This is the average for everything. But you can see um, the budget we got back from the program, um, which is a good one. So this is the general look of the new program. It has three pillars. The first pillar one um, deals about academic institutes, successful, um, excellent science in the academia. The second, the second deals about global challenges, societal challenges. Um, it has call for proposals, different topics. You can see it, it um, has different clusters. Each cluster consists of different destinations. And in the destination, uh, we have the call for proposal. As I said, all the scientific topics um, are in, in any topic you're interested in, in any topic your technology um, relates to, I can find you the right call for proposal. There's no problem. Um, this, the uh, submission is open to any um, legal entity but must consist a consortium. Consortium is not less than partic three participants from three different countries, three different European or other associated countries that are members um, in the program. Israel is one of the three. Um, so this is a very important issue here. So two things are important. One is you must have a consortium. And the second, which is more, more important, you must find the um, best call for proposal for you. The third pillar um, deals with the industry. 
um, you can find here the European Innovative Council, the EAC um, Accelerator, and as some of you probably knew it from the previous program. Um, and I'll say a few words about this pathway. I'm sure most of you are interested in that. So just a few words about this EAC accelerator or SME instrument, or as it used to be called a um, few years ago. So now it's the European Innovation Ca Council. In addition to the um, pathway you knew, it has three more, the EAC Pathfinder, Pathfinder the EAC Transition and the EAC Accelerator, which is, um, which are focused in disruptive technologies in the very first um, stages of development. You can see here the TRL is one to four. And I won't talk about it more. If you're interested, um, contact us later. The other pathway is the EAC accelerator, the one you know. Um, it will continue in the next program, but it will be different. The main goal is the same. The EAC Accelerator looks at to support companies where the EAC support will make the company attractive to other investment investors, um, decrease the risk uh, necessary for the scale up of, of the innovation as it used to have in, the, in 2020. Um, there are two main options. One is grant and one is blended grant and equity. Um, there's one slide here that demonstrates who could apply. Um, it's not very different from the previous program, so I won't go over it. I just will say two main differences. The one is that the submission um, from now will be in two stages. Um, the first one is a very um, short proposal, but you can apply for the full proposal only um, if you pass this stage. And you won't be able to submit again and again um, as it used to be in the previous program. So these are the main differences. More details, um, I invite you to join us in the orientation presentation that is going to be on the February 24th. I'll give you all the details after you can register to the um, presentation and find all the details, all the changes from the previous program and ask all the questions. So as I said, I'm going back to pillar two. Pillar two deals with global challenges and I'm going to focus on cluster five here. Cluster five deals with climate, energy and mobility. As I said, in order to take uh, to participate in this part of the program, you need to identify a call for proposal. You need to be part of a consortium, but it could be from any legal entity. Um, any consortium consortium could um, be uh, from the academia, from the industry, for. Um, any, any legal entity you can think of. These are the participating countries. Um, you can see here the 27 member states, 27 member states and the 17 associated countries. Israel is one of them. None of these countries have signed the association agreement yet, but everybody are um, optimistic. So in order to participate, you need a consortium. The minimal con minimum condition is at least three independent participants from three different countries. At least one should be from member state. Additional, additional conditions could be 
in any call, call for proposal um, you can look at if you need participants from other countries or maybe a bigger consortium. The evaluation criteria, as it used to be in the um, previous program, if you knew it, um, as it used to be three criteria, excellence, impact, and implementation. And just in general, uh, you can see that it takes five months to evaluate the proposal and three more months um, to sign the grant agreement. So in general, it takes eight months from the submission of the proposal until you can start the um, project. So it's not for tomorrow or next month. In addition, each call for proposal has its own deadline. And as we see the program um, for now, the current template we have, the current draft we have, um, deadlines are not earlier than September. So you can probably submit um, a proposal in September and eight months after you'll be able, if you're successful, eight months after um, you'll be able to start the project. So as I said, um, the program consists of clusters. Each cluster has in each pillar, there's clusters and each cluster consists of destinations, different destinations. And in the destinations, we have the call for proposal, uh, which consists of several topics. Each topic is a, a different call for proposal. Um, they might have the same deadline, but the topic is different. If you're interested to join the program, you should identify um, the best topic for you, the best call for proposal. And when you identify this topic, you should look at the specific deadline, the specific budget it has for this call for proposal. And then you can continue with looking for partners. Everything can be done in parallel and you should do it in parallel. At the moment, we have enough time until the beginning of the submissions so you can do it um, relaxed but at the end you should do everything to look for partners um, to use your networks to ask us to help you um, to go to brokerage events matchmaking events joint workshops any event you can find we offer a lot of um, opportunities to meet new partners um and when you write a proposal to, you can you're invited to consult us you consult experienced colleagues and there are also private consultants in the market um some of the topic i just took out the topics related to mobility i assume these you'll be interested in as i said climate five in the program consists of climate, energy, and mobility. I'll jump to the destinations that deals with mobility, which are five and six. And you can see we have the general destination is clean and competitive solutions for all transport models. It deals with zero emission road transport, aviation, waterborne transport, impact of transport on environment and health. Each topic I bring here um, consists of several call for proposal and several topics. So it has many call for proposal for you to find the best one for you. The other destination that deals with mobility is safe, resilient transport and smart mobility services for passengers and goods. Um, it deals with autom automated mobility, multimodal and sustainable transport systems, safety and resilience. You can see that, as I said, in my department, we have NCP or head of sector for mobility, which is Ophelia Welch. You're very welcome to consult her, um, to contact her, to consult her um, about the specific 
topics specific call for proposals according to your expertise, to your technology, to your needs. Um, we are all very happy to help. So this is what I have. This is the topics. Um, as I said, the orientation presentation for the EAC accelerator will be at February 24th. Um, you're welcome to join it, to register to the um, presentation, of course, the virtual presentation. In any issue related to um, call for proposals, topics, consortiums, um, please don't hesitate to come to me or to Ophir. Um, I also, I will also send you a leaflet we have which summarize all the topics um, in mobility and any other issue you're interested in, you might be interested in related to climate, environment, energy, could be also related. Um, please don't hesitate to come to us. Um, so keep in touch. I'm Chagich Wimmer, Ophir Welch is the head of sector for mobility and both of us and others in the department and in ESA will be very happy um, to talk to you. Thank you very much. Dr. Schwimmer, thank you very much. Now it's time for, for the question of the audience, so please don't hesitate. Anybody that would like to ask Dr. Schwimmer, now it's the time. Well, it is too quiet. So uh, I believe that we'll go to the next one. Um, we are sorry that uh, Elbit was not uh, be able to participate in this uh, conference. So we'll go to the, um, to the next one. Uh, I'm talking about the Innovis. Um, Mr. Uh, Oren Boskila is the chief R&D officer and co-founder at Innovis Technologies in Israel. Mr. Boskila will speak on the high performance solid state LiDAR sensors and perception software, which enable the autonomous driving resolution. Mr. Boskila, please. Hello, my name is Oren Buskila, and I am the Chief R&D Officer and Co-Founder at Innovis Technologies. And this talk will be about how Innovis is enabling the autonomous driving revolution with our high-performance, low-cost LiDAR. Now, many of us have been dreaming about autonomous cars for decades now. Uh, also, the potential benefits for, of autonomous cars for the whole uh, global economy are enormous. and uh, Fortunately, this is now becoming a reality, gradually becoming a reality, uh, as we're seeing more and more companies uh, now leading autonomous driving uh, projects. However, there are still a few gaps uh, hindering companies from uh, really achieving autonomous driving. One of those uh, central gaps is the sensing system. Today's system uh, sensors include cameras and radars, uh, which are already common in, uh, in many car models today. However, these are not enough to ensure uh, safe autonomous driving as, as many, uh, many accidents unfortunately have uh, demonstrated it, such as the one that you're seeing here uh, with, with a Tesla, an accident, a terrible accident from, uh, from a few months ago. Um, now, the, the uh, thing that's missing is actually quite, quite known because it's already integrated in the development platforms. This is what you see here as those um, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets that you, uh, you can find on, on cars uh, that are used for, uh, for developing autonomous vehicles. This thing is called a LiDAR. 
This is uh, a laser-based sensor that produces a high-definition 3D image, unlike a radar and a camera. However, uh, the problem is this, the, those sensors are, as you see, very big, bulky, expensive today. And this is what Innovis has set out to solve. Innovis uh, started uh, in 2016, around five years ago, uh, with uh, four graduates of uh, Israel's elite R&D technological unit from the mil Israeli military called Unit 8-1, uh, which is famous uh, for developing highly complex uh, systems for really um, unusual uh, technological needs. Many companies in Israel, many uh, very high profile tech companies were started by uh, Unit 8-1 uh, veterans. So Innovis is also, also one of them. We also have many uh, alumni of 8-1 uh, of in, in uh, Innovis today, just besides the management, also in, in the R&D uh, um, and the rest of the company. And we started in 2016. Since then, we've partnered with several very large tier one companies, tier ones uh, in the automotive world are the uh, uh, car part manufacturers. So we've partnered with four of the largest ones globally with Magna, Aptiv, uh, Samsung, and, uh, and Hiren. And in 2018, we've been nominated by BMW to provide the ladder for the first autonomous car. Actually, this is the, going to be the first autonomous car in mass production uh, globally in the industry, the, the iNex that you see here on the bottom right. And um, uh, this is a car that will be uh, starting production in, uh, in 2023. Uh, in addition to that, we've, uh, we've raised over a quarter of a billion dollars in funding so far. Uh, that enable us to uh, uh, to bring this product to production, and we've recently announced that we are going uh, public, uh, going to become a publicly listed company in Nasdaq. This is happening very soon. Um, the product that Innovis uh, offers is is twofold. Uh, the first uh, part is the hardware layer. This is the lidar itself. And uh, we are offering something that is simply unrivaled, uh, inexistent today in the industry. And this is a high performance, low cost, uh, high reliability LIDAR that can enable autonomous driving. Uh, the second uh, half of the solution is the perception layer that uh, uses the point cloud that is output by the LIDAR in order to identify and make sense of what's uh, what can be seen in the uh, in the surrounding of the car, for example, uh, a truck or a pedestrian or the uh, lane markings. So the the Innovis light or the hardware. Will, let's begin with that. Um, we've been able to dramatically reduce the cost of the lidars compared with the tens of thousands of dollars that current uh, lidars uh, lidars cost uh, by means of a dramatic reduction of the uh, bill of material, just of the number of comp of components. The way we've, we've done this is by uh, changing the many, many uh, pairs of, of lasers and sensors into basically just a handful of those with a very smart scanning mechanism that allows us to, um, to avoid the need for, for uh, a lot of components. We've also designed an ASIC, which is capable of processing dozens of, uh, of analog channels in parallel uh, thus enabling to output this very high density, uh, high frame rate point cloud that you can see here. This is taken from, from a real uh, Innovis One sample just uh, recently. You can see the very wide field of view. This is 120 degrees field of view uh, in width, 25 degree in height. You can see the range, you can see the resolution of 0.1 degree, which is unrivaled today. So this is the hardware layer. The software layer on top of it is uh, sort of mobile eye, but based on a, on a LiDAR. Mobile eye uses uh, images, uses a video, a 2D video feed to identify objects. And we use our own point cloud, a 3D point cloud, unlike a camera, in order to, to identify objects, obstacles, drivable area, etc. And this is, uh, 
capable of, of identifying objects in, 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 in the obstacles in, uh, in many incidents where a camera and a radar fail, such as very uh, low uh, lighting conditions or, uh, or weather conditions. So this adds the level of safety, of reliability that a self-driving system needs to have in order to really uh, be, uh, be able to drive uh, people safely. Here you can see those two layers working uh, simultaneously. You have the point cloud and you have those bounding boxes, those green boxes, which uh, were generated by our perception software running in real time on the actual uh, processing platform in real time. You can see on the left, the same point cloud by taken, but taken, but seen from the top. This was taken with the same, this is the same data only presented from a top view. You can see objects detected uh, at a range of up to 250 meters. Unlike a camera, which uh, um, cannot really, you cannot measure the actual distance to a car. Here you can see the uh, exact range measure, measurement of each object uh, to the uh, accuracy of, of a few centimeters. And we can see many other uh, videos in different driving conditions and, and, uh, and scenarios on our YouTube page. You're welcome to go to YouTube and search for Innovis. You will see all of those. Now, Innovis was uh, nominated by, uh, by BMW in 2018. Um, many, uh, many people ask me uh, whether LiDAR is going to replace cameras or radar. The answer is it's not going to replace them. Uh, the three are all necessary to uh, uh, deliver a safe autonomous driving system. So in the BMW project, the LiDAR and the, the uh, perception layer, they work uh, in parallel to uh, mobilize uh, computer vision and to, uh, to radar-based computer vision. All are integrated together by a so-called high-level fusion software uh, to produce the the uh, overall uh, scene perception that is then used for the car to make its driving decisions on. <clears throat> now the performance is uh, very important, but it's it's uh, in the automotive market it's far from enough. Reliability and quality are also uh, key in this market. And the Innovis One our lidar was developed from day one with all of the automotive. Uh, standards implemented in the development process and in the testing process. Um, these include uh, safety standards like ISO 26262 and software development standards like ASPICE. You can also see the various um, environmental condition testing that you see on the right, such as vibration, um, water pressure, wind, EMC, thermal shock, etc. All of those, uh, the Innovis one has already passed. We also test our LiDAR outdoor, of course, in, in real life conditions. Uh, these are additional videos that you can find some of them online. And at, uh, at this point, we are uh, ramping up the, the high volume production line after uh, producing samples in limited quantities for several months. We are now ramping high volume production in the United States. Uh, in uh, in Holly, Michigan, all of those are actual machines now producing the different, the various levels of the system assembly for, from the subcomponent to the final assembly. Um, the way that we've been able to reduce our costs uh, to the the level that is uh, unrivaled is by using uh, 905 nanometers. This is one thing, uh, unlike other companies which use 1550 nanometers. 905 nanometer allows us to use a very low cost, very simple laser diode rather than an expensive fiber, uh, fiber optic uh, laser. And also this allows us to use a uh, very low cost detectors, silicon based, unlike the 1550, which use indium gallium arsenide. Now also uh, several other um, system uh, tricks and, and, and design features that allow the uh, the uh, the safety and, and the and the uh, uh, simplicity of the si of the system, but we will not go into those at the moment. But in the end, the Innovis One uh, is the only ladder today that's able to achieve the uh, the performance needed for highway autonomous driving at the at the right price 
with the level of safety and maturity, and as we're already ramping up in production and available for um, uh, consumer pro uh, projects today. This is the Innovis One. This is what's currently in production and offered to customers. We're already working on the Innovis Two, uh, which will have even uh, better range performance, but with a reduced cost of just 30% uh, compared to the Innovis One. This will enable it to be um, uh, popular, not only in the premium market uh, for companies like BMW, but also for the uh, more uh, medium range car manufacturers like uh, Fiat Chrysler, for example, and others. Innovis has a global footprint, both uh, in R&D and in, uh, in sales and business development. We have sites in the US, Japan, uh, China, and Germany. And uh, going forward, we're seeing us expanding beyond the consumer vehicle uh, segment, which is currently the, the largest opportunity. Uh, but there are additional uh, very attractive and interesting markets such as robot taxis and shuttles, which is an emerging one, trucking and platooning, uh, which is already also picking up very nicely, and uh, longer term even things like uh, uh, logistics and sidewalk delivery companies like Amazon are working on such projects, uh, industrial drones and in the agriculture, uh, mining and other heavy machinery markets. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to keep in touch. You can see my uh, email address below. Hope you enjoyed the talk and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Corin, thank you very much. Uh, you had uh, some questions. Um, Gregory Lazarov asked you about, uh, do you need to use photon counting detectors? Okay. Um, so uh, I, I cannot address the specifics of the uh, technology, uh, but uh, photon counting is not, I can say it's not necessary in our concept. There was another uh, question from uh, Gregory, which was uh, about uh, our scanning mechanism, whether it's, uh, whether it's MEMS based. And the answer is yes, uh, we're using <clears throat> our own, our own uh, um, uh, in-house developed MEMS uh, module. This is a considerable part of our uh, IP and concept. And this is uh, a really unusual uh, MEMS uh, scanner in terms of its uh, uh, scanning capabilities, uh, frame rate, um, angular tilt, etc. You had also a question about raining condition. Uh, can you address this? Sure. Yeah, so uh, rain conditions are part of the reasons why LIDARs are necessary at all, because cameras are challenged uh, with uh, environmental conditions such as uh, rain, fog, etc. Uh, so there are two parts to the answer. First of all, uh, the way that we deal with uh, uh, raindrops that are uh, falling through the air is by having uh, more than one reflection. We can detect not just reflection coming from a raindrop, but also from the object behind the raindrop, we can sense additional reflection. So we are in this sense, uh, not very much affected by rain. The second uh, part of the solution is that our uh, window, the optical window is hydrophobic. So it evacuates water drops very quickly. So uh, the impact of rain is, uh, is uh, very small. It's negligible on the ladder performance. What about dust? For dust, we have a cleaning mechanism, uh, which uh, um, is activated when the LiDAR detects mud or other debris on the window. Uh, and once such a blockage is detected, we have a cleaning mechanism that pops out and uh, sprays high, uh, water, high, high pressure uh, water to clean the window. Um, there, there is a question uh, have you um, have you ever test your systems uh, submerge in water? I see. Uh, well, the the ladder is in fact tested uh, submerged in water, but just uh, for purposes of durability, because a ladder, an automotive ladder, needs to endure 
things like car wash and heavy rain, but it is not planned to be used underwater because uh, the, the water is very dispersive for laser. So this is not a good application for, uh, for LIDAR. Uh, there's another question here about our laser, 905 la laser emitter, which, which I, I really mentioned. Uh, it is a, a, an edge emitting laser, unlike 1550 nanometer lidars, which uh, require a very high cost fiber laser. 905 diodes are very low cost. And uh, we use a total of four lasers, four diodes in the end of this one, which is uh, really in the range of just a few dollars of uh, bill of material cost. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? Do not hesitate. Oren is, uh, is ready. Okay, Oren, I think that you answer all of the questions very well. And I would like to thank you again. Very, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, so... Uh, we will go to uh, to the next one, and um, uh, Mr. Christoph Gale is a program manager at the FMB in Germany. He is responsible for the definition or for defining the establishment uh, contact with strategic uh, customers. Mr. Gale will speak on lidar R&D at component level within the research uh, fab. Microelectronics in Germany. So, uh, Mr. Galay, please. Hello and a very warm welcome, everybody. My name is Christoph Galle. I'm representative of Research Fab Microelectronics Germany. And today I'm very happy and pleased to have the opportunity and chance to speak in front of you on LIDAR at component level, and especially the R&D side, which we provide. And I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be here to get in touch with people from Photonics Iceville and, and to take part in this event for Photonics for Automotive. So yeah, let's start. We have 11 um, Pranov Institute and two Leibniz Institutes, which form this one-stop shop for technologies and system. And all in all, it's 13 applied R&D institutions. All the project is funded by the German government. And within this microelectronics um, R&D facility, we attach different fields of application. And one of them is transport and smart mobility connected mobility, power electronics, and especially vehicle environment detection are very important fields for us. Coming to the vehicle environment detection, there are different topics we address, radar, for example, sensor data fusion, but today the focus will be on LiDAR technologies. In general, there are several different working principles for LiDAR and the ones we are focusing on is for example MEMS based scanning lidar. You see it consists of laser diodes, sending optics, MEMS based scanning mirrors, where we have very strong competencies on with different drive mechanisms. Um, the goal is to detect the scanned objects or to scan the surrounding, for example, to find other cars. The reflected light will be received by receiving optics, which we call like that. Later on, it's going to um, be processed on the photo detector and detected. And the signal processing, of course, um, has to be done by a special IC to yeah, get the relevant information out of the scenery. Another very important principle for us is the flash lighter. Flash lighters illuminate a bigger part of the scenery than scanning lighters. So with one um, sending um, frame you receive very much more of the scenery and um, but therefore you are limited in the distance um, you need less components especially no mems mirrors but essentially an array of photo detectors is needed and um, before the signals can be processed later on so these yeah all in all principles are the, the ones we are focusing on they're different ones 
but to give you an insight in what we do in the one-stop shop for LiDAR and solutions. And we especially work at component levels. So we conduct R&D for new components and work together with system integrators. And we have more or less the entire value chain for different LiDAR systems where we have our, our um, work we conduct on. We address different wavelengths and try to develop customized solutions for our customers. Now I'm going over to my slides. Um, first of all, I want to give you a deeper introduction into the research fab microelectronics Germany. Um, we already had a slight um, introduction in the video, but um, to show you another part of what we do and um, more detailed information, I would like to start with the map of Germany. So you see we are a decentralized R&D institution consisting of 13 R&D institutes and two of them, the one in blue on the map, are of the Leibniz Association and 11 are from the Fraunhofer Association and all of them together form the research for microelectronics Germany. We have a lot of scientists in there. All in all, it's more than 2,000 scientists and the investment of the German government was 350 million euros, which is very much. And all of the money was put into new infrastructure to have an update in the clean room facilities. And yeah, therefore we have a lot of different activities. We work on technologies like radar, power electronics, sensor systems, MEMS devices, and also technologies like microwave and terahertz and optoelectronic devices. For us, it's very hard um, to show every single part we are working on. And therefore today we try to focus on one topic, which is LiDAR. We submit um, the um, vehicle environment um, in several different um, topics. Um, camera, radar, LiDAR and ultrasound are parts of the vehicle environment recognition in general. And the overall goal which should be achieved by the vehicle environment recognition is to detect the whole scenery around the car as you see in the picture which arises in the, in the slide. Complementary competences we offer on the software side, the sensor data fusion, and on the hardware side, the HO integration, which means to find an adequate position of the sensors within the car and to miniaturize the systems so that they can be very well integrated. The general problem um, up to today is that a lot of sensors or most of the sensors are very bulky are very costly they are to be found in positions in the car which are not perfect and we think that microsystems could be a solution over there on the image you see that a lot of uh, the sensor system is positioned on the top of the car and um, more um, adequate positions would be in the bumper or on the headlights and these are also things we are working on Another important aspect we think um, should be should be addressed is that a good mix of sensors is to be found to detect the whole scenery. So every sensor, as you see on the right right hand side picture, has its own advantages or disadvantages in comparison to to other sensors. For example, radar has very good um, properties when it comes to detection under bad weather conditions, on poor lightning or at night. Um, but LiDAR is a very big advantage um, in the object detection and the classification of the object. In camera, you have, of course, in bad weather conditions, um, problems or struggles to identify the object. So the clever combination is very critical to enable safe autonomous driving. And challenges which LiDAR technology is facing is, of course, cost reduction. When you have micromechanical parts such as um, yeah, systems of uh, very well-known manufacturers who are positioned on the top can cost up to 70k. Um, we try to address um, prices which are way lower below 1,000 euros um, and a nice integration. Uh, range and dimension of the systems um, are very important. So at least you have to address um, 100 meters um, in front detection, side detection can be less, and the dimension, of course, has to be as small as possible to integrate it very well. Um, based on the video, we already had the overview of the two technologies we are working on. So, MEMS-based scanning LiDAR to be found on the left in the picture, and flash LiDAR. 
you see in the comparison that MemSpace scanning ladder has one beam which is then um, then formed by the by the mem scanner to um, yeah detect obstacles step by step. So you scan you scan the scenery step by step, and um, compared to the flash lighter on the left, you um, scan the whole scenery at once. So the transmitting light um, is very is yeah quite much than um, compared to to the scanning ladder systems. Um, furthermore, we work. Um, on optical phased arrays and this is from the TRL quite low and the TRL for flash and scanning ladder is way higher. Wavelengths are very important as well. 905 nanometers um, has several advantages um, in the manufacturing cost. So this is based on CMOS processes which are not that expensive. 1550 nanometer in comparison has a lot advantages in Bad weather conditions because you can put more laser power in the lighter system and so the range is going to be way higher and in bad weather conditions um, the laser beam can pass through and gives more information and feedback. So in here in the next slide you see the expertise we offer within lighter. So we work on the entire value chain so along the entire value chain in the um, row above you see um, components for 905 nanometer systems and below for 1550 nanometer systems. So the abbreviations stand for institutes which are part or partners of the FMD and from laser sources to optics over beam steering, receiving optics, detectors and the later on signal processing and sensor data fusion. We offer a lot of components such as MEMS mirrors and other components we focus on later. Complementary competencies are design and test. Of course, you have to make sure that your designs and your systems work as you want them to work. And the integration topic I already mentioned is very crucial as well. So you have to make sure the systems are small and um, yeah, they have to be reliable when it comes to shock vibration, humidity, high or low temperatures, and these are things we address as well. Now we um, talk more about LIDAR, LIDAR at component level. Um, following the, the laser beam, we start um, at the laser source. And the Leibniz Institute FBH is a very important partner for us and a very important part of us. They provide um, systems or lasers for, for lighter systems based at nano, 905 nanometers. And you see it in the right hand side picture. This is a laser with three emitters. And in front of the laser, you find a beam splitter to focus the beam correctly in the, um, in the range and in the, um, in the scenery you want it to be focused. So the optical power or the peak power is very high, three meters, and you can reach up to 100 watts at 85 degrees C. And in comparison to this laser, which is quite affordable for a system, uh, we also offer um, indium phosphide based lasers um, with yeah, lower peak power, but um, which are depending on, on um, eye safety issues um, adequate for, for lighter systems in the, in the future as well. Another important component we put very much um, effort in is uh, the MEMS mirror. So the devices can be uh, either 1D or 2D scanning devices. So one axis or two axis can be the working axis. And the deflections can be resonant, quasi-static, and also um, caused by magnetic um, influences, as you see. And the drive mechanisms, as I told you, are already uh, electrostatic, piezoelectric, and magnetic. And also, we are very flexible in the dimensions, so we can produce very small MEMS mirrors or either very large MEMS mirrors. This very much depends on um, the application you want to address. Scan ranges or optical scan angles or field of view, however you may call it, can vary a lot as well. Um, I will show you a project later on within this talk, which um, enables a very broad field of view. We can reach optical scan angles up to 180 degrees. This can be a nice application for the sight detection of a car. And in general, 
the uh, MEMSMERS have um, yeah, a very high temperature resistance. They are nearly um, free of fatigue and they are produced in a fully CMOS compatible, compatible um, micro machining process. So there is a suitability for mass fabrication later on, which is very important as well. Packaging is another crucial issue um, to make uh, hermetic encapsulation at wafer level can um, can help against dust um, fog shock and all the things like that and um, so to make sure um, the mirrors work appropriate a nice package is relevant as well and um, coming to the detectors um, there are two main activities we follow and um, especially in the single photolin avalanche diets um, we can provide arrays and the photo you find um, an array of uh, 192 by two lines um, up today um, we have a matrix array as well at 64 by 48 pixels and um, so this is very very much um, suitable to flash ladder solutions and also based on a CMOS process with um, um, pre-proposed processing um, of signals on chip level and a time to digital converter of course as well so the important aspect um, as you see in the picture below is um, that there's a wafer to wafer approach um, and a nice bonding process so that the detector and the wafer uh, and the signal processing wafer are yeah very very near to each other and that the processing of the signals can be done very quickly um, another um, aspect we work on are silicon photomultipliers and they are based at 905 nanometers are suitable for, for this wavelength as well. Um, coming to compound semiconductor photodetectors, we work on indium gallium arsenide based APDs, so in the short wave infrared. Um, there we have a very, very um dedicated and very good solutions um, it's a very huge array of pixels and um, 640 by 512 pixels arrays can be built up and they are very sensitive so um there was um yeah there was built up a system based on laser gated viewing as you see on the on the, to on the bottom of the slide uh, with a maximum range of one kilometer and a very high distance resolution and uh, lateral resolution as well of course um this is a high-end product and um, especially therefore the costs are high-end as well so this is a very um unique unique system but you can see and um, based on that slide that there's a lot of possibilities to achieve very high-end systems um, you have to always um, think about the price and things you really need for your application. Now I want to uh, go a little deeper into what we do on a daily basis. Um, we also work together with industrial partners and here are named um, only three, but they are quite, um, quite interesting. AI is a um, California-based startup we work together with and especially in the development of MEMS, we are in cooperation with them. MEB Automotive based in Germany, there was a strong collaboration um, in the development of a, of a volume or high volume process and together with Fraunhofer IPT and there was a nice cooperation and Occumented, a startup from Germany and we have them in our startup support program where we enable startups with a proof of concept um, to realize their ideas and to bring them into a first demonstrator. Um, this slide um, shows more or less the result of our joint project with Occumented. So we designed a LiDAR system for a wide angle. So the goal was to, to detect as much of the scenery um, in the horizontal field of view. And as you can see, based on the system requirements, we achieved 140 degrees. Um, combined with vertical field of view of 15 degrees and very high resolutions. Of course, the range is not that high because if you scan the whole scenery step by step, um, there's not enough time to to detect um, enough frames to go to go that far and to reach a very high range. This was a joint project um, which we did in FMD with this um, 
startup um, cooperation partner. We did it for three of our institutes and brought more or less their um, yeah, standard components, which they develop and they very well know um, together. And so these components were um, a 1D resonant MEMS mirror, and um, the CMOS bed detector I showed you before, and of course the pulse lasers um, from, from the Leibniz Institute FPH. <clears throat> Um, further competencies I also mentioned before, of course, on the software side, this is multi-sensor data fusion. Um, when using a car, um, you have to make sure to create a joint um, view of the surrounding based on all the sensors integrated. This is a work we are um, providing as well. Um, and when it comes more to the LiDAR um, technology, we developed an automated labeling tool. So in former times, um, a lot of data labeling was done by hand. Um, we have a tool chain which provides you with access to, to algorithms and systems which pre-label the data so that your system can, can learn from raw data and um, can put um, the algorithms you want to use um, on this huge set of training data for for AI algorithms, and um, also the storage of the data can be can be performed position and time synchronous in a in a web based solution. So this is done by our partners, which are more focused on the software side. With all that, I just wanted to give you a very broad overview. I hope that this was yeah kind of interesting and I could make. Um, make visible where we are working on and um, if you have dedicated questions just feel free to get in touch to sum it all up i want to give you an overview of how to cooperate with us we provide very very different services and um, our standard business model would be industrial contract research so that we do joint r d projects with an industrial partner and we can provide them in the first step with a feasibility study and um, later on, we also can go over to a pilot fabrication once we um, figure out which are the required specifications and um, technology and process development um, to hand over to the partner can be realized as well. When it comes to high volume production, we work together with special foundries. We can transfer our processes and that's the whole value chain. Of course, we also work on prototypes and demonstrators, as you saw in our cooperation projects, and licensing in general could be an issue as well. Um, cooperative um, R&D projects um, can be used as well um, if you want to do research jointly, which is funded by public authorities, and um, we are open for that as well. And from time to time, there are um, cooperation projects um, which are um, yeah, provided and supported by, by the local governments, and we would be open to join in such programs as well. So if you have any questions, just feel free to get in touch and we may help you. So we try to be the, yeah, the initial contact point for, for all this research work, which is, which is done in the FMD. And if you have any other questions for communication technologies, radar um, components or software algorithms, just feel free to get in touch and we try to help you out as, as good as we can. So thanks a lot for your attention and I hope to look forward to nice discussions later on and to interesting contacts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Mr. Galet. Um, it's a uh, question time, so please don't hesitate. Don't be shy. Well, you have a question for uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, so, uh, can you read it? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Actually, am I possible to? Yeah. Can Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, perfect. Um, yeah, there are several activities, of course, in the Horizon Euro projects. And um, so because we are um, the separate structure, um, yeah, there will be um, different activities at component level. So if somebody has any questions, uh, just feel free to get in touch and I will um, have a look if they can be part of a consortium. But um, we have no centralized activities, um, which are, yeah, in our central um, organization. 
Um, do you have uh, any contact with uh, Israeli entities like university, research center, uh, industry? Um, yes, we um, have focused this in the last year. We tried to set them up. And Fraunhofer, um, for example, has um, um, a yeah, department in Israel. And we would be very um, happy to get in touch with more companies. We have several projects um, in different um, fields. Um, but of course, we see a lot of, um, of overlap in the technologies and a vivid startup atmosphere in Israel. So we would um, be very pleased to help out and to do more with the companies because um, especially when it comes to startup um, companies which have a strong needs for, for all the process chains and all the clean room equipment, we see very good connections to, to have corporations. I'm sorry, I think you were on mute. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Do you, um, do, do, is there any questions from the audience? Please, mm -hmm. Desi. Well, I believe that we will be in contact in the future. So if you like- There is one more question. You, please, go ahead. Is licensing the only way uh, of tech uh, transfer? Um, no, it depends actually. Um, there's several ways of business models we can address. Um, like a normal way would be if you if you have a special request um, and want to, to have things developed or um, to have some, some common components or product. And then we just do um, yeah, some normal contract research. Um, then everything we do is yours in the end and licensing is especially then requested and if we have to develop technologies over several years with very long and very hard efforts and then we can give it away for free and then licensing would be a model but in general there are several ways to work together licensing is one but yeah has not to be focused all right more questions Okay, so we will be in touch in the future, I, I'm, I hope so. Yeah. And we'll uh, thank you very much and we'll go to the next one. Um, um, Mr. Carol De Vey is a program and technology manager at Photon Delta in Netherlands. Mr. De Vey will speak on integrated photonics that enable opportunities in automotive and we think in uh, Photonic Israel that uh, this technology will play a major role in the future in the automotive uh, ecosystem and in others. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Devery, please. Hello, welcome to this meeting where I'm going to tell you a few things about integrated photonics and its use in automotive applications. I'm Carol de Vries. I'm working for Photon Delta, which is an institute, an organization that uh, aims to grow and build the integrated photonics industry. And we'll tell you a few things about it in a moment. Integrated photonics, what is this? It's a highly promising key enabling technology in fact, photonics has been around for a while, but integrated photonics is relatively new, and it is a bit similar to semiconductors. Uh, instead of electrons, you use photons, and instead of transistors, you are producing lasers, waveguides, and detectors. In that way, you can make highly integrated circuits that combine a lot of bulky optical functions on a small chip. And the good thing about it is that it is a lot more compact, a lot less power hungry, a lot more reliable, and of course, it reduces cost very much. Historically, the market has been triggered by the use of optical transceivers and data centers and optical communication. And that's still a very big part of the industry. It's dominated by a few vertically integrated players like Intel, um, and it's a little, relatively limited number, but the industry is developing into a fully de-verticalized multi-billion dollar industry that is working across many different applications varying from in, indeed still data centers and but also telecom 5g 
computing, medical and biosensing applications, automotive, aerospace, etc. The expectation is that in a few years' time, there will be many suppliers delivering interesting solutions, uh, supported by um, a few foundries that can process the wafers and, uh, and package uh, the products. Photon Delta is playing a role in especially the Netherlands in trying to kickstart this industry, which is still uh, a lot of startups and scale-ups and making it grow into a uh, sizable industry. We have uh, ambitious aims. We are a small organization that is supporting uh, the, our, our ecosystem. Uh, our aim is by 2026 to have at least 25 companies in our system generating more than a billion euro in turnover and employing 4,000 FTEs in the Netherlands. And we do that in various different ways. One is we understand and connect the supply chain and we create access to that supply chain, which allows companies to build and grow faster. We do a lot of strategic investigations. We also support a global roadmap, IPSRI, and that way we support companies in their strategies. We have many contacts across the group where we deliver access to the market. And last but not least, we're not only uh, supporting, we're also funding. We are an investor in companies. And uh, not only that, we link to many other investors. And in that way, we can leverage the investment that uh, the startups need, especially to lead them to what is often called the value of death. If you look at what we currently have, then you see uh, already a sizable system. It's not only uh, a number of companies, it's not only the whole system. But on the right, you see a number of companies that are producing products effect, which is in, uh, in telecommunication, photon first, which is in so-called sensing interrogators, Omidata, Omatidia, which is in uh, LiDAR, Lionix, which is in a number of different areas, among others, health, Surfix, which is in biochips, Quix, which is in quantum computing, and, and can go on. Um, that solutions uh, system is supported by a number of companies that are providing uh, the backbone. Uh, for instance, Smart and Lionix providing wafers in respectively indium phosphide and, uh, and in silicon nitride. Uh, you can have your chips from that assembled in a company also from, uh, called Fix, but also Photon First effectively. And if you need support in your design, we have companies like Bright, which do optical design, and Bruco, uh, which do um, the in electronics design that goes with it. Uh, in turn, that system is supported again by companies producing equipment like the HEMA, for instance, with fiber attached equipment, and by knowledge institutes like TNO, CITC, which is in packaging, and the just started Photonics Integration Technology Center, which is supporting the front end. The basis of that is in a very rich knowledge system provided by the universities, specifically Eindhoven and Twente, which also have facilities for processing. All that allows you to produce system level products and connections made to that system. All right, now moving on to uh, what does this mean for automotive mobility solutions? Now, the automotive industry is going through a few very strong changes, electrification, autonomous driving, and changes in the way we are uh, providing mobility, like robo-taxis and stuff like that. All happening at the same time will be quite challenging environment for the coming years. Now, photonics, several places in that in cars less visible but still uh, uh, there's more than meets the eye is in heavy vehicles that must be said again here tesla is uh, disrupting the chain i added drones you can say what the hell do drones have to do with this but there are effectively already a number of parcel delivery companies that are using drones in combination with their vans to deliver packages and of course they need lots of sensors autonomous driving is driving also new mobility possibilities, robo-taxis, autonomous transporters. Um, the interesting thing here is that uh, from an electronic point of view, they can pack a lot more solutions, electronic solutions and systems, because you still have a good business case, because there is no driver in the car. Now, going into a little bit more detail, applications with photonic uh, content. Let's start with uh, the powertrain, electrical in this case, the motors, you wanted to measure things like temperature, torque, strain, a uh, number of other sensing things for your uh, for your motors, for your engines. Uh, that can be done in different ways, among others, photonics. I will come back to that. 
The same holds for the battery pack. There, the whole pack needs to be measured meticulously, especially on temperature. That can be done with so-called uh, FVG fibers. But also you can measure at the same time pressure, which is important in case of a disruption or strain in case you have swelling of, uh, of the cells. Then moving on to uh, ADAS and autonomous driving. Very obvious one where photonics can play a big role is LiDAR. I'll come back to that in detail. Cameras have been part and parcel of cars already for some time, but more and more are entering the car. Multi-spectrum systems, sensing systems, using all kinds of advanced uh, tools to measure, for instance, uh, driver attention or uh, uh, drive by night. Since the car is now becoming more, more or less a data center on wheels, uh, that has to do an enormous amount of data processing for all these sensors, you will also see that connectivity and networking is getting more and more, more important. Of course, cars already have a lot, CAN buses, FlexRay, Ethernet, but the amount of processing is so huge that it can be expected that also optical networks will, uh, will find a place in a car. Uh, the car has get connected with the outside world, of course. 5G is already known, car-to-car -car communication systems. Uh, that's uh, that's a given. But there are also optical means of communicating, called Wi-Fi sometimes, both for inside the car. Of, there are also system experimentations with uh, connections between cars and its environment in an optical way. And last but not least, certainly with autonomous vehicles, nobody wants their car hacked, and certainly not an autonomous one. So security is extremely important. That is already happening, but in the further future, uh, even more advanced systems could play a role like quantum uh, security, and there also photonic solutions could play a role. Then moving on to the cabin. Uh, you want to measure a number of things that have to rela are related to driver well-being. Now, temperature and humidity are important, uh, clear things, but in some areas you also want to measure air quality. Certain parts of the world, this is a really serious problem, measuring stuff like the fine dust particles or gases uh, that can be harmful is an interesting uh, an interesting addition uh, to your car environment and those solutions uh, are available and can be done in photonic ways also drivers and passengers can be monitored by for instance infrared cameras because you have to light the face and you don't want to be disturbed by it if you combine that with so-called structured light or where a kind of simple in-cabin LiDAR, you can measure a lot of parameters of uh, the driver, whether he's paying attention or whether he's feeling well. So that's an interesting application. And while you're at it, you can also add functions uh, in that way that, uh, that do things like gesture control and other possibilities uh, to, uh, to control your vehicle. Now, controlling your vehicle means also the driving characteristics, body and suspension, gyroscopes, uh, that's already existing, but you can do it also in an optical way. It's not sensitive to uh, magnetic fields, electric fields. And of course, in heavy vehicles, load and strain are playing an important role. Now, a little bit more detail about some functions. What is LiDAR? LiDAR is a complementary function to cameras and radars. Basically, you scan your environment with a laser beam. You detect a return signal. You can measure distance and speed in that way different principles to do so. You measure a pulse time, fly, a time of flight, or you can do it in a more complex way, but more accurately with called frequency modulated coherent wave. Historically, these things were the big things you saw on top of, for instance, the Google vehicle, big uh, mechanical things that were expensive and vulnerable. They're now in this generation getting replaced by systems using MEMS mirrors for scanning of flash systems which use a vexel array, that's a laser diode arrays. Uh, for instance, eBayo in Germany is using this and all using time of flight. Frequency modulation allows you a system that is a little bit more, uh, more sensitive uh, and can uh, measure speed at, as well as distance at the same time. Since there will be multiple lighters in a car in the future, lower power, smaller size, and of course, much lower cost are key to achieving this. And it's not only in cars, you can also see it in robotics, warehouses, industry, and drones. Now, the interesting thing about FMCW LiDAR is that you could, in principle, put it in one photonic integrated chip. There are many building blocks that you can make that way, like a tunable laser, a coherent detector, and if you really want to go full optical, an optical phase array that steers the beam and a grating that steers it in the other direction. It can be very compact, 
but there's still some development work uh, in that uh, that area to be done. So you can also take a step by step approach. Additional benefit is that you can do it at the far infrared, uh, which is much more easy for eye safety regulations. And the last one I want to highlight is so-called fiber break grading sensor. Uh, what you basically do here is you have a fiber, a fiber with gratings in it that uh, at certain distances, that uh, that at that distance the light is either reflected or absorbed, and you can measure that very precisely. If you put pressure on the fiber on that position or strain or temperature changes, it shifts and that can be measured extremely accurately. And the fun thing is you can measure multiple points because you can put multiple gratings in a fiber, up to hundreds and from centimeters to kilometers. So that allows you a very flexible system for measurements. Um, and that can be very much miniaturized, as you can see in the pictures on the right, and then you get an, in, an integrated and so-called interrogator. Advantages, simultaneous measurements of number of functions. A fiber is non-conductive, not as sensitive to electromagnetic interference, inert, and so safe. You can measure extremely accurately, uh, displacements of even phantom meters have been reported. That's a bit over the top for a car, but nevertheless, possibilities are there. It is already used in aerospace and in infrastructure for measuring wings on landing gear or in infrastructure like bridges. And it's very flexible due to its uh, fiber configuration. Now, the integration allows you not only very compact system, but also a path to low cost systems. I hope I've given you an interesting flavor of uh, what integrated photonics can do for you. We will absolutely happy to engage with you to explore how we can help you to drive your business forward, connect you to our cluster and uh, help you to find interesting possibilities technically or when the conditions apply in the financial matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. De Vries. Uh, it's a uh, question time, please. Well, considering the automotive uh, ecosystem, what challenges uh, challenges you are uh, facing now uh, in this technology? Okay, this is Sir uh, Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, the uh, well, well, a lot of the the challenges in the automotive industry is uh, creating, uh, well, let's say the technical challenges can be met and also the conditions of automotive and can be met by the proper engineering. Um, so that I think is uh, more a matter of, uh, of engineering work uh, since some of the solutions are already used in uh, other stringent environments like uh, outside telecommunications uh, and, uh, and, and aerospace. I think that's the, the point is more to get the, the 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 wheel going, so to say, in um, in uh, increasing the volumes and uh, lowering uh, lowering the cost, those are very important uh, conditions to make uh, applications more uh, make more inroads in in vehicles. And uh, yeah, collaboration is there a very important uh, a very important element. Is there a challenging in the manufacturing uh, process? Um, yeah, there is. It depends. It depends a bit on what you uh, what you're looking at. And um, a lot of the um, manufacturing is already ongoing and maturing, as I said. Uh, volumes are still, depending on the technology, volumes are still relatively low, with the exception of Datacom. So that means that uh, also there um, a lot of scaling has to be done, including the elements of um, uh, improving the yield and uh, and, this, and, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, which will have a big effect on the. Uh, of the cost, specifically because um, in integrated photonics, packaging is the biggest element in uh, in cost. Not so much the wafer; that's also expensive. But the uh, the packaging is the more complex one because it has a lot of extra requirements compared to, let's say, traditional semiconductor packaging. And uh, getting more standardization there and more um, uh, and creating more more volume friendly solutions uh, is certainly in, uh, still a challenge. That's one reason why we team up also with equipment manufacturers uh, in our cluster. ASML is effectively already uh, supporting uh, the photonic system in the Netherlands, but also other companies in order to be uh, to, uh, to achieve that. 
Okay. More questions from the audience? Well, it seems that you provide so very good uh, lectures, so. Thank you. All of the questions through your lecture. Thank you very much again. And uh, we we'll go to the next one. Uh, Mr. Tim uh, Kohn is the CTO of Effect Photonics uh, Netherland. in Netherland. Uh, Mr. Kohn will speak on leveraging telecommunications, coherent optics for eye safe, high performance polarization, diverse LIDAR. So uh, Mr. Kuhn, please. Oké, drie, twee, één. I saw you see the full file. It will take some time, I believe that. Drie, denk zo. Twee. That's the right file. Exactly. Effect photonics. Effect photonics is a fiber optic transceiver manufacturer based out of Eindhoven, the Netherlands, where we have our main uh, design site. We have about 80 employees and most of us can trace our heritage back to uh, Philips Optoelectronics and Eindhoven University from which we spun out in 2010. We also have a group in uh, Brixham in the United Kingdom and where we have about 90 employees where we do our optical packaging. So like I said, we make fiber optic transceivers based on indium phosphide technology. So what does that mean? Um, we make uh, the transceivers carrying uh, one gigabit per second, 10 gigabit per second, and in the future also 28 gigabit per second uh, for networks, fiber optic networks, and usually um, towards the edges of the networks. So you can find our products in fiber to the home offerings, in networks connecting 5G cell towers, in edge computing, and also in remote PHY type of applications. Now, our technologies are all built on 1550 nanometer tunable lasers uh, based on massive volume application uh, uh, target markets. So how do we do this? Um, we make optical systems on chip, and that's really the core of our uh, technology advantage. So um, we developed a wafer scale process to put lasers, tunable lasers, narrow line width lasers, coherent receivers, optical modulators, optical splitters and filters, uh, photodiodes, balance detectors, all on one wafer scale process on indium phosphide. And we use that to integrate all of the functionalities that go into a fiber optic transmission system into a single chip. And that makes uh, building fiber optic modules out of them much more economical, much more cost effective and much easier to scale. So we have been developing our technology roadmap for telecommunications, for optical transceivers, but we're now getting to the point where our chips getting more and more integrated, more and more complex, and that there's more and more overlap with the adjacent markets of uh, sensing, LIDAR and automotive, and that really is why we're here today. So the latest project that we've been working on is a full 400 gigabit per second coherent transmit and receive system. And that means uh, that we use the amplitude, the wavelength and the phase of the light and the polarization of the light to transmit data over very long distances over fiber optic networks. However, also has many more applications that we are here to scope out with you. Um, on the right, you can see what's on the chip. On the left of the screen, you can see the chip on, on a fingertip. It really is a very small and compact optical device. It has coherent receivers, it has uh, 
has amplitude modulators, phase modulators. It has a swept uh, laser source, a narrow line width source, and an optical amplifier uh, built in, which means that the, all of the optical elements for a time of flight, an FMCW, a coherent, but also a dual polarization LIDAR system are all present in one semiconductor die. And we're coming to think of it like a reconfigurable optics processor that depending on what electrical signals you put in, you can use it for many different uh, LIDAR type applications. And because it is built on our scalable wafer scale uh, platform, it's usable for many high volume applications. So we're building this optical element into a small form factor uh, optical engine. It's about 30 millimeters. Uh, it has all of the electronics, all of the driver circuitry necessary to hook it up to a uh, client system. And on the right, you can see uh, sort of breakout board evaluation kits that we've already built around this optical engine. So this is a optical engine that could be used for you know, multi-application LiDAR systems. And we're, we're interested in exploring that further with people here. So in a nutshell, Effect Photonics is looking for partners to leverage our telecommunication technologies, but now for sensing applications, to build novel application-specific optical sensing and LiDAR systems using our high-performance optical engines, and furthermore, to co-develop new iSafe devices for sensing security and biomedical. And if you're interested in that, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always interested to, uh, to talk to uh, people from the market. Thank you very much for your time. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Well, I see one question. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't see. Uh, oh, yeah, in the chat. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you read it? I can read it. So it's right. from uh, from Frank. So what is the status of tech transfer into light power systems? Is this just an idea or are there projects already? So, um, you know, as any company who is uh, producing something into the market, we have to focus and our mo uh, main focus is and has been for the last decade on the telecommunications markets because they have very well defined um, uh, roadmaps and they have been investing a lot in uh, integration technology because the need is very much there. Um, in my role as CTO, we're now expanding into adjacent markets uh, and we're seeing that the type of uh, challenges in fiber optic telecommunications are very similar uh, to fiber optic sensing applications and also to free space sensing applications such as LiDAR. So uh, what we have seen is that we are really working on a semiconductor technology um, and the main benefit from semiconductor technologies really comes from being able to make the same thing but in very high volume. Um, meaning that we are now looking to work with uh, partners to take the optical engine that we have, right? Leverage all of the um, you know, the, the manufacturing expertise, the reliability data, the volume scaling that we, that we have and the high performance and build around that, um, you know, demonstrators and, and application specific uh, wrappers to use for, uh, for LiDAR and sensing applications. So at the moment, we are not producing um, in, 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 in volume any LiDAR particular uh, product. Um, in fact, that is also not our intent. Um, we will very likely remain a telecommunications manufacturing uh, uh, company. However, um, we are seeing that partnerships or even to the point of joint ventures of leveraging this telecom technology for adjacent uh, fields is something that we're very much open to. So um, we are working together with several uh, academic institutes, for example, uh, also the ecosystem partners like Carol, who presented the uh, meeting before us within Photon Delta to work with partners around us in, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, but if we look further out, there are many expertise centers around the globe, uh, which could leverage this technology. And that's really why we're here. So it's early days yet, but I think it's a very interesting opportunity. All right, you have uh, more questions in the in the chat. Uh, 
in the Q&A, I believe. Ah, there we are. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was looking in the, in the chat and in the Q&A. So yeah. another question is, does it include the laser detector? Yes, it includes a very narrow line with full band tunable laser. Uh, it's 1550 nanometers, basically 1525 to 1575 swept. Um, it's uh, a sub 100 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz uh, instantaneous line with uh, laser. It includes the coherent detector and the mixing. And I think one of the most uh, interesting aspects of this is, um, you know, we've seen in some of the presentations here that one of the ways to get distance is to launch a whole lot of power. Um, actually, if you use coherent mixing, you get 20 or 30 dB of, of mixing gain, meaning that your detector is so much more sensitive not only is it more sensitive, but also you can filter out all of the ambient uh, uh, light because it is not coherent with the laser light that you're sending out. And I think those two points really make for quite attractive opportunities in, uh, in, in real world scenarios. So uh, we can do launch powers uh, per polarization of about 20 to 50 milliwatts CW. Um, but that's all uh, focused in a very tight uh, uh, laser source. So uh, at the moment, we would consider this to be used with a scanning or a MEMS type of system. Um, what's also quite interesting is that it has the ability to separate uh, the phase, the amplitude and the polarization information, meaning that you could do instantaneous uh, distance, speed, but also depolarization ratio measurements. Um, so we're thinking it as a, you know, a prototyping platform for high-end LiDAR solutions. I, you know, I don't think it's the, the, the best solution for a very simple you know, time of flight LiDAR. There are much better solutions uh, for that. But if you want to know a whole lot of information uh, over long distances and be very impervious to outside influences, uh, such a coherent device could be uh, 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 very useful. Uh, what makes it transceiver eye safe? Uh, it is a CW system uh, based on 1550 uh, nanometers, and it's below the eye safe classes there. Okay. Okay. Good. Any more questions? I see nothing. Maybe in the chat. Uh, yeah. How short can the light pulses get? Uh, we can make light pulses. Uh, well, we have a optical modulation bandwidth of about 40 gigahertz. So that is, you know, 10 picosecond scale, something like that. 10 to 50 picosecond scale. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. And uh, we'll go to the next one. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. David uh, Canaves Canavesi is business development manager at Scantinal in Germany. Mr. Canavesi will speak on solid state 155 micrometer FMCW LiDAR, how to leverage the combination of silicon photonics and optics for the next generation LiDAR. All right, silicon photonics is very, very interesting. So please go ahead. Hello everyone. My name is Davide Canavesi, Business Development Manager at Scantinel Photonics. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce you our solid state 1550 nanometer FMCW LiDAR that leverages the combination of integrated silicon photonics and optics. To start, let me briefly introduce you our company. Scantinel Photonics is a spin out of Carl Zeiss based in Ulm, Germany. We focus on FMCW LiDAR for the next generation of autonomous mobility. We have a very peculiar set of competences, mixing expertise in the areas of laser technology, photonic integration and scanning, optics and software. Like everyone working in this field, we are also confronted with the following requests from the market. A LiDAR for autonomous mobility should 
augment the perception capabilities of the vehicles where it is installed, enable new profitable business models, and provide a very cost-effective solution. This is how our final product will look like and how we are approaching the aforementioned challenges. Our LiDAR is based on coherent FNCW ranging and uses a 1550 nm integrated swept source with narrow bandwidth and high linearity required for FMCW. For what concerns scanning, it leverages the combination of photonic integrated chips and optical collimator. This unique approach is what we call Optical Enhanced Array, OEA. Our product is based on CMOS compatible silicon photonics, targeting a fully solid state solution for high volume. And lastly, it achieves high megapixel per second data rate by using a high parallelization of multiple FMCW channels. This approach brings very clear benefits that are highly appreciated by our customers. By means of the optical enhanced array approach, it provides low power, fully solid state scanning. The LiDAR can measure over 300 meters range with superior resolution and provides a 5D point cloud at more than 2 megapixel per second. Our system, being based on coherent FMCW ranging, can measure direct velocity in every pixel and by doing this, improves objects detection and classification. Finally, by selecting only CMOS compatible technologies, the system is designed for high volume manufacturing at highly competitive price position. At Scantinal, we believe that collaboration is essential. For this reason, since the beginning, we are collaborating with top companies like Zeiss, Bridger Photonics, iMac and Fix in different areas of our technological development. We are currently looking for partnerships in the following areas. On a technical level, we are looking for collaborations on the following topics. Micro isolators, either chip scale or micro optical components, semiconductor optical amplifiers with high efficiency, advanced assembly technologies for micro-optical components with high throughput suitable for volume manufacturing, low-power 1550 nm switches with small footprint in CMOS compatible technologies. On a financial level, we are currently in a Series A round of fundraising and we welcome potential investors. And lastly, we can share long-range FMCW measurements results, also in adverse conditions, and we are looking for proof-of-concept projects with partners in the following segments – private vehicles, delivery vehicles, mobility services and industrial. Summarizing, Scatinal Photonics is developing a fully CMOS-compatible solid-state FMCW LiDAR. Our product achieves superior ranging and resolution performances by leveraging the first CMOS compatible on chip narrow line width swept source at 1550 nm. It provides a low power fully solid state scanning by combining integrated silicon photonics and optics in the optical enhanced array scanning technology. And finally, it brings best in class resolution with more than 2 megapixel per second in ranges over 300 meters. Thank you, and let's connect to explore possible synergies. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Canaversi. Um, question, it's time for, for your questions, please. Well, I think that uh, we finished with this uh, session, the morning session. Um, I would like to thank uh, the audience as well as the lecturers for their participation and also for the uh, very interesting lectures we had. The next uh, session will start uh, 
in one in about one hour it will be on uh, one o'clock 1 p.m uh, israel time so um, enjoy the the uh, recess time and uh, be back uh, on time thank you very much <laughs>